So um, welcome everyone to this session. This is a, a session about the lifetime management of uh, aortic stenosis, tailoring treatment options um, and securing future possibilities. And this is sponsored by Boston. Mm -hmm. So I'll introduce the, the panel. I have a spokesperson, Nicholas Van Meegen. He will be putting his spoke in periodically. <laughs> Uh, discussants Vlasis Ninios, Kuli Sandu, and Tessel Vossenberg. So, welcome to all of you. What's in the lunchbox? Is it nice? <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, I've just realized I'm going to have to wear this for three days, oh, aren't yeah. I? And take a shower with it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Is, and does anyone know when the music starts? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't worked it out yet. So, no, at the same time, uh, David, also, uh, it's my role to encourage the people here in the room to also participate actively in this session and please use the chat to ask questions if you have questions and questions comments whatever and then i can uh, have a look and, and see whether we can also address these questions uh with the panel so without further ado maybe david we yeah, can proceed so, so we have a, an excellent uh recorded case which will feature some of the the factors that we we're looking to learn about today. Um, so, Vlasis, why don't you come and tell us what, uh, what the case is about? Thank you, David. So, uh, this is a patient that uh, we performed as a team. 79-year-old female with, of course, aortic stenosis and YHA class 3, some comorbidities, which you'd expect. Um, the interesting thing is that the patient has coronary disease and had uh, PCI of the CERC uh, four months before the procedure. And these are the uh, numbers from the ECHO, so severe aortic stenosis, some moderate pulmonary hypertension, and the Euroscore 2 was calculated at 7.9%. ECG sinus rhythm, narrow QRS, nothing really impressive. It's a small anatomy, so perimeter derived 20.7 20 millimeters, um, and the height of the coronaries is good. SOV and STJ dimensions are good, and the aortic annulus angle is 50 degrees. This is how the valve looks like. It's a tricuspid tri valve with moderate uh, calcification. The height of the coronaries, as I mentioned. These are the angle of the tax and the two implanting views that we're going to discuss about. Some issues with the um, femoral axis. You can see there's quite a bit of calcification, some tortuosity. So we had to debate which axis was the better. We thought that the right had enough dimensions. Four by seven was the least. Uh, on the left, it was a little bit more challenging. So we decided to go on the right. Here is another view of that. So the plan is to implant an accurate NEO2, size small, pre-dilate with a 20 millimeter balloon, try to obtain commissural alignment since the patient is young and we want to make sure that we have coronary access secured for the future. We'll try to get a sentinel implantation, but uh, we didn't have any baseline CT to look at the uh, cranial vessels. And as I said, we'll try to negotiate the right femoral artery. Okay, perfect. Before you press play, um, any comments from the panel about that case, suitability or otherwise, features that are in favour of having a, a super well, valve? I, I think an, an important feature is obviously the small annulus yes. that you mentioned. I think that really narrows down our options if you really are looking for a more patient-tailored approach and valve, size, uh, valve platform selection. Yeah. And I think in that regard, uh, the super annular functioning valve that you're about to use is... Uh, Makes a, makes a lot of sense. Perfect. Did you, did you get a calcium score routinely from your CTs? Or, or we, we did. Um, I haven't recorded that, but it was about uh, almost two, yeah, about 2,000, two, I think. 2,000. Two two yeah. Okay, perfect. It yeah. wasn't severe, severe. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't. Okay, great. So it's a very suitable case, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Nice. We were happy okay. with that, and uh, okay, I great. can show you what we did. Let's see what you did. So let me show you what we have done so far. We have obtained right femoral uh, arterial axis via cut down because we were concerned about the calcification. So um, we got a, a stiff wire up to the ascending aorta. And then uh, we were able to uh, go up with our eye sleeve through this uh, tortuosity and calcification without any problems, as you can see. Our original plan was to go to... Um, 
the uh, by radial axis to have the sentinel and also the pigtail from the left radial. Unfortunately, the left radial is not uh, uh, palpable. Uh, I think it was uh, because the coronary angioplasty was done via this artery and uh, the artery was thrombosed. And on the right side, we were not able to thread the wire. So we obtained a left femoral um, artery instead, arterial axis. And these are the two views. This is the cusp overlap uh, view that we obtained, pre-specified by the uh, CT scan. And this is the uh, three cusp view that we obtained. Um, we had to modify the original uh, CT uh, image, but uh, this is where we are now. We have a pigtail in the non-coronary cusp. So uh, now we will obtain our um, access through the aortic valve. So we will try to cross the aortic valve using a straight wire. <coughs> Wire positioning is very important for every TAVI, particularly for the accurate technology. It's very important to have free wire. I think my wire is not free right now, but I'll try to negotiate that with a pigtail. So we were able, by using this maneuver, to get free from the papillary muscle. So we can look at the hemodynamics now of the patient. So you can see that uh, there is a significant uh, gradient, which is around 50, peak-to-peak -peak gradient, around 50 uh, millimeters of mercury. So we decided to use um, a Safari wire, small, and we will pre-dilate using a 20 millimeter balloon, 20 millimeter. So we want our wire to take in the position of the peak tail but it's very important for the, for the wire. We can see the pigtail is at the apex. It's very important for the wire to sit comfortably like that. So some pulling and pushing is required in rotation. It's very important that we have the loop of the wire pointing upwards and also the shaft of the wire to be sitting comfortably at the outer curve of the uh, ascending aorta. Now we will uh, be ready to pace at 180 beats per minute in order to do the pre-dilation with the balloon. So let's have pacing on at 180 bits per minute. So inflate. That's great. Deflate. Pacing off, please. Great. So we required some pacing following the inflation of the balloon. That's quite interesting. Excitement. This affected the, the conduction uh, properties. Okay. I think the rhythm has recovered uh, more or less. Whatever pacing at 40. Okay, good. So we will try to implant at the commissural alignment. The insertion aid should be uh, pushed a little bit forward while we're pushing in the insertion aid and the implant. Then we have to give three gentle pushes while we uh, keep track of the wire. Then we, is, there is some resistance at the beginning. Then the insertion aid goes back. The resistance is because we're dilating the sheath. And then we're going to move forward. 
So I can uh, say a few things here about the commercial alignment. Uh, there's a, the first step, as we, you saw, we insert the valve. Uh, then we look at the three um, uh, posts of the valve. We need them to be equally spaced. If uh, two are on the left and one on the right in the three-cusp view, then we are prepared to rotate clockwise and vice versa. Two on the right and one on the left, we prepare to rotate counterclockwise. Then we move to the cusp overlap view that we need to the see. The um, just one second. We need to see the um, uh, two cusps on the left, uh, the two posts on the left, and the free cell on the right. And the rotation, the video will show that in a minute, it has to be slow. And once we obtain the view, we go back to the three cusp view and we implant. So we can show that now. Uh, oops, sorry, wrong button. There. So this is uh, the view that we'd like to see this free cell on the right and the two posts on the, on the left. And we're happy that we have uh, commissural alignment on the cusp the overlap view. The commissural alignment, all the wires, very nice, is to keep the dot at the top end of the pigtail. Now, when we look at the picture, we can see the two posts on the left side of the image are uh, closer together than on the right. So we know that we have to give a clockwise turn so we go to the cusp overlap view and we will perform this maneuver. There's no point of rotating while we're in the three cusp view. So here, with the clockwise, the two posts should come to the left side of the picture and the three cells should point on the right. It's, it shouldn't be a too big too difficult maneuver to perform. Can you push the wire in a little bit more? So it's going to be slow. I'm taking the handle. It usually takes a little bit of a delay until it moves. Usually 180 degrees is enough. We can see that now the posts are moving and the three cell is on the right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let the rotation go back. And then we'll go back to the three cast view to perform with the business as usual. Here is a confirmation that the three posts are now almost equally spaced. So now I'm going to push in to get the dot, the bottom part of the dot of the marker at the bottom part of the pigtail. I'm keeping my hand steady. So let's take a view. We're ready. Okay, we're not too bad. I'm going to move it slightly a bit more. Keep the wire steady, please. I'm going to take another image. Uh, you ready? Inject, please. I think we're good. So let's start 1A, please, Elias. I'm not pushing more, I'm keeping my hand steady. Let's open the crowns. Okay, inject please. So I'm going to push a little bit more. That's good, let's go 1B. We can focus the camera on our hands, please. That one, please. Okay, inject again. Great. Big tail uh, off, please. Can you do that? Like this. Great. So, let's go for a quick two. You ready? Two. So, very quick movements here, and you can see it open. You can see the stand holder moving down. This is what we like to see. So now, Pakis and I will just remove the wire back a little bit. I think let's go to a mark view. That's better. Okay, so I'm pulling back very gently with the stand holder. Push the wire in, please. That's great. Thank you very much. So we go back to the descending aorta. So let's reverse the movement. Go back on two and then on one. Two. 
Yeah. We can see on the image that the posts are equally spaced, but we will take some additional years to confirm the commissural alignment. The hemodynamics of the patients are actually pretty good. I'm going to help you a little bit. Okay, good. So let's uh, put the pigtail into the uh, uh, left ventricle. There was a little bit of standstill. The patient is quite sensitive, despite the ECG not being a right bundle branch block. So it's quite interesting to see whether this patient eventually will require pacemaker. Our experience with accurate mu is that the pace in rate is very, very low. Well, we'll have a, I mean, we have the wiring, we have quite a lot of hardware in the ventricle, so that could be affecting things. So let's have a look at the hemodynamics now. So in the hemodynamics, we see that there is now no gradient, and there is a very nice separation between the diastolic uh, uh, numbers. And you can see here that the two posts are on the left side of the picture, and there is one post to the right. So that's a proof that we have commissural alignment. So as I said, and you saw the two posts are on the left, of course, they may not be exactly right, and you may have mild or moderate misalignment. But uh, in this case, we got it right. And we are going to show some 3D images later on to prove that also. Um, to the cusp overlap view and take a final shot to assess for PVL. The hemodynamics are so good that it's very unlikely that we have any PVL, but we have to confirm that. So, let's inject. Lovely. So there's no PVL. We're happy about the result. Okay, so let's uh, remove the pigtail from the... Uh, and... Um, so... This is the end of the case. The patient did very well discharged on day three. You have seen during the balloon inflation and also manipulation of the wire, we had some uh, ventricular standstill. But actually, the patient had no issues um, during the admission and later on. This is the discharge ECG that shows sinus rhythm and uh, no, very narrow QRS. Um, so, we can discuss about that. Perfect. Thanks very much. It was a really nice case. Nicely done. Um, there's quite a few things that we can discuss. I'm going to start by saying I'm really pleased that you did a really proper pre-dilatation because quite often you'll see that people will take a, a subannular size thinking that all that's needed is to make some space. But actually what you did was you took an annular sized balloon and inflated properly. And our, our experience certainly is that in doing that, you much reduced the chance of needing to post dilate, which is of course a slightly higher risk phenomenon once you've got the valve in position. Is that something that you have developed over time that you've gone to a, a, an annular sized balloon? Did you start smaller? Well, we started smaller in the previous years being conservative and being afraid that will disrupt the anatomy and cause a lot of AR. But uh, as you grow bolder, we realized, especially with this technology, that aggressive or proper, shall I say, predilation actually is very important because you ensure excellent uh, stand-up position uh, against the tissue. And that will ensure valve expansion and proper work of the leaflets, uh, function of the leaflets too. I think the case illustrates quite nicely the stability of the valve. And the reason you achieved good stability of the valve and able to deploy it in such a great manner was L your LV Safari wire was right in the apex stable. You had great outer curvature uh, on the wire, but also on the delivery when you did deliver the actual um, accurate platform itself. And as Dave said, you had excellent uh, pre-dilatation. So it's a great example of, of why you had such an excellent result at the end. The wire wire uh, position is... As I mentioned, the video very, very important. Uh, it gives you this stability that uh, mm -hmm. you just mentioned. We had difficulties here. The, mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of MAC, as you sure. probably so, saw yeah. on the fluoro. Mm -hmm. And the, probably the subvalvar apparatus was also quite thickened too. And we ended up getting trapped in the anterior papillary muscle. So we had to manipulate it. Yes, I saw that you changed. You, you, you crossed with an AL. Mm -hmm. And then you changed to a pigtail. Is that something you 
always do? What do you said something you we do all the time? All the all the time. Yeah. We do it with every case, um, just to be sure that we're in the right position because mm. we often have this problem that we get stuck behind the papillary muscle. And okay. with the pigtail you can maneuver a bit more without damaging anything in the ventricle. So it's mm. a safe option and it takes only a short time extra. What about you, Nicholas? Do you do that always? I must say, we don't. I mean, I tend to use the amplets and position the wire, and if it's good, that's, that's well, fine. Yeah. yeah, that's my approach as well. Yeah. So I have, I have some, some, some tricks to, yes. to make sure that I get the proper positioning and a proper loop uh, in the apex without uh, converting to a pigtail cat. Yes, Dolly? And so predominantly, okay. it's a pigtail. Yeah, oh, it's it is quite sort of split. In the audience, mm. uh, hands up who routinely switches from an AL to a pigtail. <coughs> okay, and hands up who just takes the AL and puts the safari straight down that. Okay, so a minority actually taking it straight on the, mm. the amplas. That's interesting. So, so, so I think, David, what was quite remarkable from this case was the, the, mm. the rep repeated events of total AV block that you mm -hmm. saw, yeah. right? And that was because obviously all the manipulations that were done and that are inevitable in a TAVI procedure. But I think this uh, underscores once again the importance of the top-down deployment of this platform. It's, it's a unique way of deploying a valve, but the result is that you do not interact with the frame at the level of the LVOT. So you don't create additional trauma on top of what you're doing with a balloon and with a wire. So we have a research in, in 2010 published in the European Heart Journal where we already demonstrated that up to 50% of the high-grade AV blocks are being induced with aggressive ballooning or just introducing a stiff wire mm -hmm. uh, across the aortic valve. So I think this is a definitely a unique feature of this platform that um, probably also um, explains why we have these single-digit numbers of, of pacemakers. That's a very valid point, and uh, you have seen that despite of all the rhythm disturbances, the patient has been rock steady hemodynamically. We were not at all concerned, uh, and we that gave us the time to do all the manipulations for the commissural alignment, change the views, take our time without any any problems at all. And had you put a temporary wire in? Sorry, I missed. Yeah, I missed yeah. it. So yeah. it, because because yeah. you, you you knew there was a risk, or, uh, and and as a parallel question, to that do you normally pace? just on the LV wire for balloon dilatation? Actually, well, we're a little bit old-fashioned. We've made that as a routine. We always put a temporary wire, okay. and we use the right uh, internal jugular vein for that. Time. Yeah, yeah. It, it works. It's like a no-brainer. I can so. ask the audience again, who puts in temporary wires routinely for their TAVI? Oh, look, you're really old-fashioned. I am. <laughs> and who he was paces, right in this case. He was right in this case, because actually, when you had complete heart block and you wanted to take the wire out, you'd have been stuck. Well, you need <laughs> to wait for a couple of seconds, but, you know, from sure, time to yeah. time that happens. And yeah. what you do then is you park the delivery catheter in the descending aorta and then you, you pace on the wire until the issue has resolved. And it's, it, I think it is our default practice to no longer put a temporary pace. And who uses in. the LV wire to pace? Yeah, most people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's easy to forget, though, that you're pacing on the wire and put, start pulling it out. And then someone goes, oh, it's a lot of P waves and nothing else happens. <laughs> well, a little bit yeah. of focus is, all, is allowed during a procedure. I guess if somebody pulls the wire accidentally from yeah. the LV, that's a little bit of a problem. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. I appreciate the fact that the LV pacing is now the trend. No, no, sure. Yeah. But so it... But David, there was also a question from the audience going back to the initial strategy. So you mentioned in the history that the patient required a PCI of the circumflex. And then the question obviously is, okay, but when do you do the PCI? Do you do it before or after? And, and uh, a colleague in the audience says, yeah, but why don't you do it after? Because we know from the activation trial that there are more bleedings if you do it up front. So you could have avoided the DAPT during the procedure. What it, are you sensitive to that kind of uh, strategies? Well, we've yet? done all sorts of combinations. Um, this patient came, was referred to us for TAVI after the PCI has mm. been performed, so we mm. didn't have any choice. But we've done before, we've done during the procedure, especially high-risk PCI, and we've also done after. And certainly with a platform like Accurate Neo2, the ease of coronary access gives you the opportunity to do a PCI later on. So mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, if the frame is different for supraannular valves, it may be difficult to get in and uh, it may be more challenging to get coronary access mm -hmm. after you put the TAVI. Yeah. But here you could argue about doing it after. 
No, I totally agree. I mean, often in our MDTs, do we PCI first, have you first? I think go to have you first makes the PCI procedure a lot more stable. And then you can always, like you said, you've got good coronary access with, the, with this device technology. Do the PCI afterwards if you can. Yeah, I mean, if Absolutely. you get into trouble with a PCI whilst the patient has severe, severe aortic mm. stenosis, that can be very bad. Absolutely. So, I mean, certainly our practice mm. is so long as the aortic stenosis is severe, Fix that first, because that's giving you triple vessel ischemia. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then only focus on the coronary arteries afterwards if, if you, you need, need to. It. Yeah. Do you? What do you do in the Netherlands? What's your strategy? Uh, we're having big discussions about what yeah. to do in the Netherlands. And to be honest, uh, when patients come to our center, it depends on who is the operator on the yeah. on the CAG that mm -hmm. we do before, because some will just put a stent because they say, ah, oh, it's 80 year old and it's going to be a TAVI, mm -hmm. so we have to do PCI before. But we are now more and more saying we're not going to do it before. We're first going to do the valve and see if the patient has any complaints yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Because even if we look at the stable angina trials, we should be more conservative with PCI. Yeah. So why not yeah. in TAVI? So, so I agree with that the last comment. I think it's too early to make a firm recommendation to, to the community to say it or to, to make the claim, well, you know, you always have to do it afterwards. I think there is also maybe a patient-tailored approach um, acceptable, but at the same time, there are several uh, randomized controlled trials evaluating uh, exactly this question. So one of them is, is ongoing in the Netherlands. The other one is uh, being run from uh, Zurich, where it's the TAVI PCI trial, where patients are randomized one to one to either PCI upfront or the TAVI upfront, and then the PCI. So it's it's gonna, it's, a, it's a very relevant, mm -hmm. very relevant question. And then there was another question from the audience, if I may. Um, why not subclavian access from the get-go? Well, um, we do use occasionally subclavian uh, access, um, but in this case, we were quite confident that uh, we had good access from the right side. And as you saw, the eye sleeve had no trouble navigating, and the valve through the sleeve. We didn't feel that there would be a problem there. Okay, so Vlasis, you have some uh, CT 3D exactly. imaging for us. So um, these are uh, some work that the R&D from Boston Scientific team put together. And to me as a physician, actually, it's very fulfilling to see all this. Um, so as you see, this is the cusp overlap and the three cusp view on the, on the right and on the left. And this is the position that we uh, obtained. Uh, and we were happy that we had commissural alignment, but actually the verification of that uh, was done by superimposing the fluoro images as well as the pre-procedural um, uh, pre CT. And you can see that how the accurate NEO is actually positioned in the, into the 3D uh, imaging of the valve. And this is a virtual uh, coronary angiography that uh, shows that the access to both coronary arter uh, arteries is pretty free. And the bottom uh, two pictures are uh, 10 years or 15 years later when this valve degenerates and we decide to put a balloon expandable valve into this frame. So you can see how this pink here is uh, the Sapien 23 valve that is actually implanted inside the short frame of the uh, Boston, uh, the accurate valve. And actually, they fit very nicely, as if they are made to one for the other. And still, we're able to obtain access to the coronary arteries. And uh, the verification of that came actually from a 3D printed. So the R&D team printed out this aortic root, and they proceeded into a proper implantation of the accurate uh, neosmol. And you can see that the coronary access was free from the top part of the valve, which is open. And then they really implanted a balloon expandable valve into the frame, as you can see. These are the leaflets of the old accurate, which should be calcified, of course. And these at the bottom, you can see the leaflets of the balloon expandable valve, but still the coronary axis is unobstructed. So to me, that was very, very revealing to, to see, you know, what we did now and what can happen for this patient uh, in the years to come. It's okay, part really of the nice. lifetime management. Also. Yeah, really nice. And I noticed that when you did the um, fluoroscopic adjustment to try and get commissural alignment, you did it, you, you were slightly in the valve and, and slightly above. Do you normally do it higher than that or do you normally do it in position with the nose just onto the valve? Well, actually, the rule of thumb that I didn't mention, but um, when you have the pigtail at the bottom of your aortic root, you uh, put the fluoroscopy marker at the top part of the pigtail loop. Uh, 
So you still have a few millimeters to push in, but you shouldn't be really too high because if you're too high, by the minute you push in after you obtain your commissure alignment, you may still rotate a little mm. bit and you lose your position. Yeah, yeah. So just at the top, patient was very stable, no issues there. And am I right in thinking that it, it's actually more important not to be commissurally misaligned rather than to be perfectly aligned? Exactly. Which, I mean, That's you have quite a margin for error because of the open design. The, the most important thing is when you have your three posts equally spaced to make sure that you're not totally malaligned because that is identical in the three cusp view. So once you switch to the cusp overlap view, then you know where you are. It's Perfect. the proof. Yes. When you talk about alignment things, I mean, it's a useful point too is that if you've got the flush port at about six o'clock when you first go into the actual sheath yeah. itself, your two thirds, almost two thirds, going to be uh, commissionally aligned anyway at that point. And it that's does help. Certainly a, does help yeah. for, that's a great comment, us. yeah. I think in terms of lifetime management, everybody needs to respect these principles of commercial mm -hmm. alignment these days. I mean, we know how to do it, and lifetime management is, is really one of the important features as we move to lower risk patients with longer life expectancies. You will need to re-access the coroners at one point. Yeah. Perfect, yes, good comment. Okay, so, Kuli, shall we hear now about yeah, well, the clinical data, the accurate NEO? to platform. Okay, so I'll just move this. So I've got the enviable task of uh, five minutes of uh, clinical data. <laughs> okay, so we're ready. Uh, ready. Um, Kuli Sandu, one of the uh, interventionists up in Liverpool. Um, okay, so conflicts of interest here, of course. So, yeah, what's our current clinical experience? Well, if you take the Aclinia 2 platform as well as the Accu platform, there's over 50,000 patients that have these devices um, implanted. Uh, this current studies um, have more than just over 2,400 patients, of which I'll mention four, uh, five out of the six of, of here. And 50 countries are now using the actual, procedure, uh, the actual platform and device itself. So the, the, the experience with this particular platform and valve is, is growing, as we can see from the presentations here and later on the week. So there's been some design updates. Okay, so we've mentioned one really important things that we've seen on 3D, which shows quite nicely, that there are some consistent features between the two devices and, the, and there is some difference to the reiteration of the device. The first course of the opening stabilizing arches, which also which help two ways really, is to help you to provide stability when you're deploying the valve and implanting it, but also for coronary access height. You clearly got super annular leaflets, which could provide superior um, effective orifice area and you're using small annuli, as we saw in the case presentation below. And again, you've got the upper and lower crowns, which also help with the um, um, coronary um, access at a later date. But what you have got, the iterations are markers. You've got a, a radio opaque positioning marker. And we saw a nice demonstration in the case before, just to get the device in the correct position. There's a autography done to ensure that the device deployment was in exactly in a controlled fashion that the operator wants it. Secondly, the extended uh, per, um, ceiling skirt, which decreases the risk of paravalvular regurgitation or, or paravalvular leak, and that's 60% longer. And you see the moving images with those arrows, what the active PV seal skirt does. And I suppose the question, this all looks very fancy on big talks, but the question is, does it actually matter? Does it make a difference? And these are the key outcomes of the top five uh, studies which I've, which I've gone into and had a look. And it was quite nerve-wracking because some of the authors are very much in the, in the audience. So uh, I'll try and do a good job. So the first one I wanted to start off was this really this um, post-marketing surveillance. And that was a prospective observational single-arm study looking at the, basically the efficiency, um, efficacy, but also the safety of the device given the previous studies with the old um, accurate um, platform. And it showed that there was a number of centres, 18 centres, 250 patients, 30-day outcome. And you can see that the new pacemaker, the pacemaker rate was low, the residual gradients were low, and more importantly... The, the um, PVL of being either moderate or severe was also low, and again, low, street, low risk of stroke. So that, that sort of proved that there was good um, data that there's safety, um, but also good outcomes in, in, in these patients. I suppose going back a little bit further, the early NEO2 trial, this was the first large trial or study of the deployment of the accurate NEO2 device. 
And interesting here, these were consecutive patients. So that's really important. That probably highlights that this could be, you know, closer to real life patients, arguably, um, for, for these devices. And there's 554 patients suited for that. And again, the number of centres involved were 12 all across Europe. Showed very good and and positive uh, outcomes regarding the new pacemaker was a single digit six percent. The gradients again were low as it might be ex expected, and again the persist the existence or or the resulting moderate to severe paraval PVR was again was just two point seven percent, and all cause stroke was only two point one percent. Sub studies from from these patients looking and comparing the results from the accurate device from the scope two trial showed very favourable outcomes with lower pacing rates but also um, lower and uh, risk of paravalvular leaks. So again, that showed that actually these, the new iterations for the device has had some, you know, having some benefit and improvement. And I think this Italian near registry was uh, observational retrospective registry, uh, which was propensity matched. It's a very, very useful study with 13 centers in across Europe. And again, although that the, again, what we'd expect, you know, the, the pacing rates were low, the, the gradients again were low, um, and all cause as, and stroke were again low. But this also compared accurate NEO2 compared to the old accurate valve and showed a threefold decrease in PVL. There's also a decrease in the requirement for pacemakers with that study. Now we move, um, the fourth study is the first really accurate NEO versus a Sapien Ultra, the blue and expandable valve, and with some fancy maths and pump. From propensity score matched, showed very favorable outcomes in terms of procedural success, low risk of complications. But interesting, did highlight the, the, the usefulness of having a supra annular valve showing lower transvalvular gradients, which when you, when you mathematically uh, look into this, uh, like look into this, showed some significant difference. And it's point to know that only 2.4% of the patients that had the ACO Neo2 uh, had a transvalvular gradient of greater than 20, which was much less than for the other uh, balloon expandable uh, device. Lastly, the Nipro2. Again, so overall, there were 763 patients, but 452 were matched with corresponding patients undergoing the Evolute Pro Stroke Pro Plus. Again, these were propensity score matched. A number of centres were 20. Um, again, at one month, their risk of pacemaker was 7.7, .7, which was lower, a lot lower than the other the device itself. Residual gradients were again low risk of PVL was only 1.7%. And subgroup analysis um, and data collected for this showed that this was the outcomes were very, very similar in terms of success again and also low risk of complications. And this was irrespective of the uh, calcification around the aortic cannula, showing it's a safe valve for even in heavy calcified vessels. So, I mean, this four is it's just a nutshell of going through other five trials. But I think the key for this session are. So you've, in this new device, you have low pacemaker rates and also the lower risk of PVL of being either moderate or severe in severity. You can't do a lifetime management talk without commercial alignment. It's been mentioned already. And I think it's very good. And I think these two studies, the Coma Align and the Neo Align study, have suggested that firstly, it is reproducible. And certainly, there is a learning curve. And I'm sure my other co presenter will say there is a learning curve, but actually, it's not as it's not as cumbersome as you'd first imagine. You just need to be patient. And, and I think it was a lovely demonstration. Take the autograms, get position with it. Patient stability, you have time. Wait for the rotation for any, any catch-up of any, um, resist, of any um, stored energy. Um, and it shows reproducibly, and more importantly, it's safe. Because clearly, the second thing you worry about in our group of patients is when you're rotating the valve, the longer you're there to be, is there a higher risk of stroke? Are you going to cause vascular damage? But no, it's, it's studies have shown that it is a safe procedure to do. So in summary, well, there's expanding experience with this valve. And just to plug, there's a CE mark to our five-year results, which is, I think, being um, discussed tomorrow. So you should go to that. Um, Acunia to your platform. Remains many of the advantageous features of the original original platform. So, but it, with this skirt and the position, especially with the radiopaque marker, um, has has got great benefits. And I think studies are showing favourable outcomes because of the reiterations of both those things on the original valve platform in terms of PVL, pacemaker rates, safety profiles, and I believe outcome, but certainly in the short outcome. 
And lastly, commercial alignment is, is important. We've touched upon this, and you'll see this, you'll get touched upon this time and time again for life site management, not only for quarry access site, but also for valve and valve procedures. And perhaps it may have some more, more effect on PVLs or and or pacing rates. That's yet to be uh, yet to be um, identified. And, and again, I'll just say one more thing. is a selective first valve session tomorrow in 1.30 as a plug. OK, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. We've got some time to uh, to discuss things. And if anyone has any particular questions, do do come to the microphone. I mean, one of the things that struck me about uh, Accurate Platform over the years is that initially when it came, we thought, oh, it's a, you know, it's, you can't reposition it. It's, mm. Is that a step backwards? But actually, as time has gone on, it, it just doesn't really enter your head anymore in the same way as probably it doesn't with the sapien very much that because it's such a stable delivery platform that actually malposition is really very rare and i think there's two two things with that so first of all is from personal practice and practice back up in liverpool we underestimate the what, what the clues that we get so for example when you pre dilatation you can sort of see if you don't have adequate pre-dilatation, pre the balloon's going to go up into the aorta. And that's a key marker. I'll say, well, that's how the valve technology is going to, have, what's going to happen to the valve when you try and deploy it. But also, secondly, as it says top down, you've got that stability there. And as you mm. showed on your, on, your, on your case, you can apply some forward pressure that you can slightly bring, move down or protrude the, with the valve, move it forward a millimetre or two with aortogram. So I think positioning is, mm. is not really an issue. So there is also an, a question that relates to this uh, concept from the audience where they discussed horizontal aorta. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Is this a good platform for horizontal aorta, Tessa? I think so. I think we have really good results with horizontal aorta, um, especially because due to the stabilization arches, it aligns itself. And um, especially with other supraanular valves, you sometimes get a valve that's crooked mm -hmm. into a horizontal mm -hmm. aorta. And mm -hmm. we, we haven't seen that with accurate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for me, it's, it's one of the preferred valves for horizontal aorta. And I think for, horizontal, for, for torturous aorta, the delivery of the actual platform as well is also very good, so I'd, I'd, I'd recommend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and I think in terms of horizontal aorta, um, uh, I think all the valves can be used in a horizontal aorta, but you, you need a little bit more tips and, and techniques uh, with wire manipulation if you yeah. use the other self-expanding platforms. That's true. Yeah. yeah. In terms of paravalvular leak, the, the, the study data showed very low rates. Mm. Do you think that's partly down to case selection, or is that really uh, applicable across the board? That's a really good question. I mean, I think this clearly, because these are retrospective and, and observations, I think there is going to be some case selection, because there's no doubt there will be a factor of that. But I think as experience grows, as confidence grows, certainly with, um, with pre appropriate pre-dilatation and so forth, well, I think for us, uh, calcification necessary wouldn't... Um, wouldn't mean that we wouldn't do an accurate neo. In actual fact, now I think with self-expanding sort of valve, you're probably slightly more gentle because it self-expands itself rather than the blue, the blue expandable because you create some trauma and a risk of rupture or vascular damage. So I think it's very important to appreciate that at the start. Okay, great. And and one last comment. I mean, from my point of view, I must say I think this is the easiest of the valves to do the commissural alignment with. Any comments on that? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, you I think have so. Some nodding. That help you yes. A lot. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and it's much easier than uh, I know. Evolute, you can do commissural alignment, but it's much harder to to turn yeah, the yeah. valve and to get it aligned once you are misaligned. Mm. Um, mm. And with uh, the accurate, it's easier. Yes. I it's mean. also slow. You have to give it some time, but then it's it's almost always possible to align it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's fair to say that it already has all the attributes in place yeah. for optimal commercial alignment. Yes. The other de design platforms are working on iterations exactly. to yeah. introduce yes. features that help you with commercial alignment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Very nicely put. It's possible with other valves as well, but it's yeah. easy with this yeah. valve. Yeah. So, Nicholas, yes? you tell us what were the highlights of this uh, session? And uh, I don't know whether the slides will uh, appear. Okay, so basically, uh, the objectives were that we would establish the importance of paravalvular leak and conduction disorders after TAFI. 
Uh, I think we achieved that. I think we uh, demonstrated that with using an accurate platform, and especially with the latest generation, with the optimized ceiling skirt, that you will limit and, and mitigate paravalvular leaks. And also conduction disorders, I think Vlasi's case nicely introduced that in a very volatile uh, environment, you still manage to uh, stay out of a pacemaker need. So that was very important. This all has to do with the top-down deployment, obviously. Then we also covered the latest evidence relate, related to lifetime management and also uh, I think the importance of the valve design on durability and future uh, options when you re-access the coronaries and also maybe on revalving procedures have been discussed. But I think um, as the main takeaway from this session, I think we are now talking about a platform that is optimized and that has these large cells that make it very easy to re-access the coronaries. You have the super annular functioning design that uh, will result in low residual gradients. You have this improved ceiling skirt to minimize paravalvular leaks. And again, you have this unique top-down deployment to mitigate mitigate LVOT interaction and to reduce uh, the rate for pacemakers as much as possible. With that, I would like to thank the panelists, Gully, Vlasis and Tessa, and also the chair of the session, David, and I'll thank you for your attention. Enjoy PCR. Thank, thank you. you.